Hello everyone. I hope you did have a great weekend and you had a happy uh, Easter. This is week of April 13th, 2020. And I am going to move from our regular chapter, which would have been chapter 13 on psychological disorders. I am using different material as the material from the uh, your textbook is kind of outdated for this chapter. I am providing uh, PowerPoint slides that will have this information uh, available to you so that you'll be able to work from that. And um, as soon as available, I will also try to get you a link for the ebook and hopefully uh, it will be something that you don't have to pay for. But you should still be able to get this information based off the PowerPoint slides and my lecture uh, in terms of being able to answer questions for the exam. On that note, let's go ahead and get started. Now in this chapter, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going over what is abnormal behavior, things that creates uh, causes abnormality. I'm going to go over the diagnostic statistical manual. Um, then we're going to talk about anxiety disorders as well as obsessive compulsive disorders. We'll take a look at depressive and bipolar disorders as well as the eating disorders. We'll look at schizophrenia, uh, childhood disorders, dissociative disorders, personality disorders. So the first thing we need to ask is what are psychological disorders in the first place? Understand that psychological disorders are those patterns of behavior that would interfere with one's daily functioning. Uh, and basically it's causing a lot of stress and distress or dysfunction in which a person really can't do what they do every day. Uh, a medical student syndrome is talking about the experiences that happens specifically to students in the medical profession. Uh, even sometimes psychology students in which they start to think they have the illnesses that um, they're learning about. You ever hear someone talking about, you might have heard me discuss in lectures or during the times we were together, speak about different type of issues or problems and then you see yourself relating to it. Here's an example. A lot of people when they hear about obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, think they fit that mold and that automatically they have that disorder. So just to let you know, we may have traits, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have a disorder. Pretty much what happens is there's a series of things that we would go through and look at before we would ever give a diagnosis such as obsessive compulsive disorder. So don't worry, you don't have anything of that nature unless you've been uh, professionally diagnosed. Don't diagnose yourselves. All right, so let's talk about how we know the difference between normal to abnormal behaviors, okay? If you look at this photo caption, some may judge this behavior as someone that deviates from societal norms. And when we're talking about social norms, really should that apply? There are some groups of people where this woman's tattoos and piercings is considered to be abnormal, but there are other cultures and um, communities that find that to be completely abnormal. So here's another way of complicating matters regarding deviation from social norms. Which norms should be used? Well, in our society, it's varied. So that what's considered normal for one per group may be different and very widely amongst normal for another group. What's normal among men might be abnormal for women. What's normal uh, in Bronx, New York can really be abnormal if you're living in the rural area of the Delta of Mississippi. What's normal amongst Blacks might be abnormal for Asian Americans. So 
experts they kind of try to consider each of the four factors when we're defining what's abnormality but the last two factors and that's basically personal distress and impairment in a daily functioning are generally going to be have or will generally have more weight than the first two factors which would be infrequency or deviation from social norms So we're going to start taking a look at what might cause abnormality. Centuries ago, there's been explanations that centered on the forces that uh, we would largely <laughs> reject today. That being evil spirits inhabiting the body or soul, which is casting spells on you, or consequences of sin leading to a person's suffering. We look at the different historical explanations but we also know that today there are other explanations that we would consider that being biological psychological sociocultural or biopsychosocial and we'll get more into those different areas so when we're talking about the biological theory of abnormality you remember in our other textbook we talked about a lot about how the brain interacts with our body and with the environment. Well, it's these biological factors that's within our, our brain, that uh, the neurochemicals, our genealogy, that would also help to uh, find out and understand about psychological disorders. In terms of the psychological theory of abnormality, here we're looking specifically at psychological factors. And that's including our emotions, our thoughts, how we act, those traits that I mentioned earlier, like if you're compulsive. And these will be the primary reasons and causes we may say that you possess a psychological disorder. And then within that, there are several theories that we work from, that being psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive, and trait explanations. So, Looking at the sociocultural theory of abnormality, in this, in this model, diathesis refers to the vulnerability with which a person is born. Stress is an event or a series of events that'll turn that vulnerability into a full-blown psychological issue. Okay, we look at the social and cultural factors surrounding a person rather than factors within the person. And those are going to be the primary reasons for the psychological disorders for sociocultural theory of abnormality. Things like poverty, oppression, political unrest, a lot of things that we know are existing today. When we talk about biases and prejudices, as well as abuses, uh, there's various types of abuse. You have physical abuse, you have substance abuse, you have different types. But these contribute to psychological disorders. When we talk about the biopsychosocial theory of abnormality, here we're looking at a combination of all of them, being biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors that would contribute to the psychological disorders. And again, as mentioned before, that di diathesis stress model, again, that's talking about vulnerabilities a person is born with and that stress to an event um, can turn that vulnerability into a psychological problem. All right, so on this figure, here we're gonna talk about some of the causes and it gives you just a visual cue to what I'm talking of and speaking of, the different beliefs and, uh, about causes for psychological disorders. So, <clears throat> It's been investigated in psychologists as well as other mental health professionals. They would make a rating like for a scale of one being the lowest to five being the highest on whether their various disorders were caused by biological, psychological, or sociocultural factors. Now, different disorders receive very different type of ratings. However, even for disorders that received a high rating in one of the uh, three categories, the other two categories were still endorsed. So an example for that 
we could talk about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia was rated as highly biological, but its ratings for psych psychological as well as sociocultural factors were above <clears throat> the bottom of that scale. Generally speaking, this pattern endorses a biopsychosocial model in which neither biology, psychology, nor sociocultural context can be ruled out as a contributing factor to any of the disorders. So how do we go about uh, doing a diagnosis? What does a psychologist use or utilize? Well, we utilize a diagnostic statistical manual and we call it DSM. We're up to the DSM-5 though. The DSM is used here in the United States, but outside of uh, the US and other countries, there are other manuals like the International Classification of Diseases or the Chinese Classification for Mental Disorders. But this book, we break this down and look at the different diagnoses. It'll tell us how common a disorder might be. It looks at whether or not um, how the disorder would impact different cultures. It looks at the duration and frequency. Its first uh, publication was back in 1952. And at that point, there was about 106 disorders present. Here in this fifth edition, which was uh, published in 2013, it has 265 disorders. So in terms of who uses the DSM and is it something that's universal? Well, this was created by the American Psychiatric Association. So it has had a basis of a medical model, but a task force was created with it. And more or less, every time they do a revision, they send out questionnaires and everything to not only uh, psychiatrists, but to psychologists, to social workers, mental health professionals. And that's who use it, particularly here in the United States. Oh, insurance companies go by the DSM as well. Just a little FYI. So as you can imagine, there's been several revisions because we are up to the fifth edition of the um, DSM. And th with the DSM-5, there were some big changes. First of all, it had been 20 years since they made the last big revisions, that being we worked off of the DSM-4 and the DSM-4TR. Um, but there was a huge shift with this current edition. An explanation for the change to uh, naming these different conventions would actually be instead of using Roman numerals, which uh, the DSM-4 uh, had represented, it went with just saying more of an Arabic uh, numerals to allow uh, edits to be noted, like five instead of using a V, okay? Because you know, when we're using the uh, Roman numerals, it would be V to represent five. Anyway, so when we go to update again, if there's another revision, what's gonna happen is now they can say DSM 5.1 a DSM 5.2 in the future to say that there's been revisions. Whereas before, like I said, the last update before the five was the DSM 4 slash TR, which kind of got confusing for people. Anyway, <clears throat> if you want to take a good look at a complete list, I can recommend that what I'm going to do is probably upload under this video at least the content pages because the DSM is like that. We consider that our Bible, just, just saying. But it's really thick. But I will give a whole list so you can see the whole entire list of the different disorders within the content uh, areas. Okay, but in the uh, push to kind of give better definitions in terms of using that biological view for abnormality. There's several new disorders that have been included in the DSM-5. That being the premenstrual dysphoric disorders, uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, 
binge eating has now been included. Most times you hear people talking about anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, but binge eating disorder was not included. Um, it was a trait, so to speak, for bulimia nervosa, but we realized that there's several different tenets that's involved with just binge eating that had to have give it its own recognition as a disorder by itself. And then there was an inclusion of mild neurocognitive disorder. So, of course, there's been criticisms in regards to the DSM. It's talking about it looks more negatively at the human experience rather than having any kind of positivity because it's all pathological. That being, it's, you know, they've given a name to internet gaming disorder, cyberchondria, meaning you can't get off of the internet ever, as well as orthorexia. It also looks at all or nothing type of diagnosis, which is a problem because it's a, a categorical type model in terms of psychopathology. That psychological problem is going to exist either totally or it's going to, it's not. It's an all or nothing shot with it. An example talking about the analogy that was given and provided for the HIV test. We've had people who have false positives who were told that they had HIV, but they didn't. And in thinking about it, if you received a false positive, you've been classified to have HIV. All or nothing. That's what they're meaning. It's also been problematic in looking at it as a dimensional model of psychopathology. That being that psychological issues exist only on a continuum. Um, and they gave like levels. And what they did was with some of the disorders that was found in the DSM-4 uh, TR, they kind of pushed and combined it all. One of those being the autistic spectrum disorders. That's been placed on a continuum in which there were several disorders um, that were all combined because they felt that they had some uh, similarities, so many similarities to them that they can combine them all. But some, like myself, felt that that was really uh, take away from some of the disorders, particularly like Asperger's disorder. Now, let's start looking directly at some of these disorders, okay? Look, first up is going to be anxiety disorders. Now, a little bit of anxiety really is never a bad thing. It actually keeps us moving, keep us working um, and motivated. But as long as it's not ex excessive, anxiety really can work to your benefit. It allows you to know when you might be in trouble. It helps to improve your performance, like I said, motivation. But there are times when it can become too excessive. Understand that anxiety <clears throat> that's excessive to the point where it, in, uh, it inhibits you from functioning throughout the day so that you get fears to the point where you're afraid to just live. Now we have an issue. Okay, so some of the primary disorders that's um, discussed here is going to be generalized anxiety disorder, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder. We're going to look at panic disorder. And of course, you know, I mentioned obsessive compulsive disorder. But this was classified before as an anxiety disorder in the DSM-4 now. And it's now in a category all by itself. All right, so on this slide, let's look at generalized anxiety disorder. Research has been able to interview, researchers interviewed more than 100 people with generalized anxiety disorder. And more or less, what they did was they asked them, well, what are you worrying about? Answers span from really wide range to very minor hassles. And you remember we spoke about hassles? early on when we was discussing stress. Well, here, this was one of those topics that was brought up. 
and some of these minor hassles of daily life um, hassles in daily life contributed to their physical illness and that being from family and having to go home um, or traveling or dealing with finances all these different issues were part of um, what actually created some anxiety for people. What separates most individuals from those that have generalized anxiety is what people with, uh, I'll just say GAD, worries about more, excessively more, much more than what they need to, to the point that it significantly will interfere with their daily living. So people with GAD, they often would describe their worries as being out of control. They'll consider things that may happen in the future. They'll fear the worst. Uh, instead of having a, a cup half full, they see it as half empty. Despite knowing that the worst is extremely unlikely uh, to happen, they're still going to feel like the, the shoe, the bottom, the bottom has dropped. Okay. So <clears throat> again, you might be anxious. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have generalized anxiety disorder because we all worry for, about things time and time again. But it's when you can't allow anything else to go on in your life that it means, hmm, we might have to take a look at that. So now we're going to talk about specific phobia. Here's something I need you to know. Many of the most common phobias comes from real threats that happened in our lives in the past. Uh, evolutionary theory actually suggests that humans might be predisposed to fear uh, to certain objects because it kind of helps in terms of keeping you safe. Fears of inanimate objects such as brooms, now that's more rare. And got a good story to tell you when it talks about brooms, okay? Using brooms as an example. I don't know about you, but I was raised in a household where my mother was superstitious. I mean, superstitious. Uh, to where she had a specific phobia, specifically in regards to if uh, we talk about the brooms, a broom cannot touch her foot. Okay? I'll never forget, there was a time we were at McDonald's and we were having a lunch. And... In there, the worker was sweeping, and she kind of put her hand up and said, look, you come back later after we're gone to sweep over here, okay? But unfortunately, the worker didn't listen, and the worker accidentally hit her foot. Well, needless to say, boom, she went through the roof. She grabbed the broom from the worker, took it, turned it upside down to where the Brussels was facing her, hocked and spit on it. Then she handed the broom back to them and said, next time don't, don't come sweeping when somebody tell you don't sweep. Well, lo and behold, she explained to me why you don't let nobody brush your foot. Bad luck will come to you if somebody hits your foot with a broom. And I was raised on this, okay? So, this is something that's been learned. She learned it in childhood because she had an uncle who came over and he got hit with the broom on his foot and my grandmother was telling him, yeah, you need to, you need to spit on that broom, okay, for something happened to you. And he's like, oh, that's just a superstition. I'm not doing it. Psst, don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm all right. Well, lo and behold, he left, and later on that day, he got arrested. So, through that association, my mother now cemented that into gold, and for the rest of her days, truly believed that if you didn't take measures to stop what happened by spitting on the broom, that something really bad is going to happen to you. And to most accounts, I've learned that same superstition that is a specific phobia I have to which if you hit my foot with a broom, I will pick it up and I will spit on it. But understand, a lot of these phobias are things that we have learned. 
Other common phobias are some people are afraid of heights. Another one of my fun fears and um, phobias are snakes. You know what? I have a couple on here. Snakes and thunder and lightning. That's a problem for me too. I, we just had a storm this weekend and when I hear about weather like that, I get in panic mode. I get really anxious and my husband, he'd be like, I don't know what's wrong with you. I pack up, you know, they said there was threat of tornadoes. So it's just really turbulent weather. I can say, I guess I could say is what my phobia is. Cause see, I make an emergency bag and I sit it in my one spot that I think I'm going to be safe in so that I don't have to worry, God forbid a tornado hit the house. I still have something to carry with me. Things like a fresh set of clothes, my money, a wallet, my medication. I pack up my, uh, I'll pack up my laptop so I can still have that and my electronics, all of that. Those are the type of things I will do. I go through a ritual each and every time. That's what you can call a phobia. Some people might be afraid of dogs, spiders, germs. Right now, you can only imagine with this real threat of COVID-19, how individuals who are considered what they call germophobia are probably in the worst case scenario of their lives right now. And they possibly, even though we are asked to stay at home, even when this pandemic ends, and I pray it's soon, but when it ends, individuals that had such issues and problems may become what we call agoraphobic, where they won't think they can ever come outside their home again. Then you have claustrophobia, which is dealing with closed spaces. Now, question to you, something for you to think about. What commonalities might you see in these different objects and situations? What makes them a phobia? I want to share one more last phobia I have. Water bugs. Scared of them. Can't stand them. Hate the sound they make when you kill them. So it makes me avoid them altogether. Alright. Alright, so let's move on to social anxiety disorder. Now here, this is an intense and irrational fear of situations in which a person may be judged or scrutinized. People often avoid social interactions and that of course them relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, as well as romantic relationships. Some people question whether social anxiety disorder should even be considered a disorder at all because it's essentially a very high level of a personality trait. You might be an introvert or really shy. And being an introvert and shy is actually on a normal range. As with other type of disorders though, the DSM is going to emphasize that the symptoms of social anxiety disorder must cause a significant distress or disruption to qualify for a diagnosis. Okay, so you have to think about what would be that difference between a social anxiety disorder and being extremely shy. If you're extremely shy, would that stop you from still interacting with others? You might, you might be standoffish, but you still interact. You'll still go to work. You'll still go to school. But a person with social anxiety disorder, they're avoiding altogether of interacting with anyone for fears of unknown. Now you heard me mention agoraphobia, okay? This can go along lines with agoraphobia when we're talking about panic disorder. Again, in this situation, the person's avoiding situations uh, from which escape might be difficult or impossible if they feel a panic attack coming on. So I talked about a person who have germs phobia and that person dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic right now. Here, they find it so difficult to be able to escape. So imagine they run out of food. They're not gonna wanna go and buy more food. 
they're going to be afraid. Okay? And that fear can get so intense that it can create what we call a panic attack. Okay? Now, this leaves people with, like I said, the feelings of agoraphobia. They become imprisoned. But right now, we are all staying at home. But we know that we can step outside at any time just to get some fresh air. And as long as we practice social distancing, wear our mask, wear gloves, that we are protecting ourselves. But a person who's dealing with germ phobia, they don't feel that's going to even work. Okay? Stepping outside, period, means that the virus is in the air no matter where they go. And that opening up the door is going to let it in. That's how severe it can be for that person. So they imprison themselves at home. And just like I said, trying to go to a grocery store, they'll have a panic attack, which they might start feeling heart palpitations, start sweating, uh, get shortness of breath, dizzy. These type of things. They'll never be able to see themselves ever going to a movie theater. They won't be able to go to a friend's house or anywhere else for that matter. They can't do it. So when we're talking about panic disorder, this is one of those anxiety disorders that's actually characterized more of a sudden intense and it's really unpredictable burst of brief burst of panic or anxiety. Um, oftentimes this can lead to agoraphobia and that hypersensitivity to is, is where they're misinterpreting their physical symptoms. They'll think they're having a heart attack and they're not. But because they think it, it increases that level of fear. It intensifies the anxiety. So here's to the obsessive compulsive disorder. The only thing I'm going to do is just outline, you know, a lot of people under, kind of understand what obsessed OCD is. But it's a disorder that's characterized by unwanting. A person who's diagnosed with an OCD really don't want to be this way. But it's those unwanted rep repetitive thoughts, having these type of obsessions, uh, which then leads to uncontrollable acts done in response to those thoughts. That's the compulsions. It's cyclic in that obsessions create the anxiety and then the compulsions is what they try to do in order to alleviate the anxiety. Here's an example. You ever go and you go out and you think to yourself, ooh, did I lock my front door? Well, you normally might go back and double check and that's fine. But a person that is dealing with OCD actually will go back a set number of times. That being they may do it 10 times before they feel safe enough to walk away from. Again, some other manifestations, again with germs, uh, you might have it where they wash their hands way longer than 20 seconds. They may have their hands under scolding hot water. They might do it for about a minute, two minutes walk away and come right back and do it again. And like I mentioned, the safety and checking, constantly checking, constantly, okay? So know that in this sense, with these two examples, when we talk about the germs, the germs, they obsess about the fact that germs exist. The compulsion is the hand washing, constantly washing their hands. In terms of talking about safety, locking that front door, that's the obsession. Going back 10 times to check it is the compulsion, okay? All right, so who gets anxiety disorders and OCD anyway? Know that anxiety disorders are one of the more common type of psychological disorders. Here in the U.S. alone, 28.8% of the population will experience an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. And nearly 18.1% of those individuals will experience an anxiety disorder in a given year. What are the differences between genders? Well, women are two to three times more likely to be diagnosed than men. 
Why do you think that might be? It research demonstrates that women worry more. Now, in terms of culturally, when diagnosed in all ethnicities and cultures, it's generally been consistent, okay? There are some cultures that would report more physical symptoms in terms of anxiety. They'll talk more about those heart palpitations, the sweating, and feeling anxious and dizzy. But there are some phobias that's going to be more apparent in other cultures, in some cur certain cultures. Certain cultures, persecutory feel, those thoughts of being chased, harassed, well, that culture. We have those type of worries and anxieties all the time. Um, prejudice can also play a part of that. And when we talk about in law enforcement, that's a particular culture in which profiling occurs because of stereotypes and so forth that creates more types of anxiety for individuals that's working in law enforcement. And when I say law enforcement, I'm not putting a specific color because I've seen individuals of uh, people of color that's in law enforcement have the same type of attitude so it can balance out when you look at it but it makes you think and wonder about are they exhibiting anxiety disorders and unfortunately because they possess a weapon it can be much more serious because of it all right so now Ain't that a pretty puppy? Just a pretty puppy. Illogical thoughts, though, can contribute to anxiety disorders. One example being, a person can illogically think that this harmless, cute puppy or dog will attack them, will be vicious and attack them. And that person's more likely to develop that specific phobia of the dog, okay? And yes, believe it or not, the when you let your anxiety get the best of you, then it alerts the dog, which now the dog anxiety raises, and they may come become and act more vicious because they're afraid of you. You gave off that energy. But things that we look at in terms of looking at why people may get anxiety disorders or obsessive compulsive disorders are those illogical thoughts. How uh, reinforcement, remember when we're talking about operant conditioning, these are learned reinforcements and punishments that's been placed here that makes us do the things we do. Like I told you about the broom, learned. Neuroticism, you know, that neurotic behavior is basically another way of saying it overly anxious. You might have had overprotective parents, superstitions, and all of that. And then there is a genetic uh, predisposition in which 20 to 40 percent of this can be inherited. All right, so now we're going to start looking at the biological uh, function in here when we're talking about anxiety and OCD. People with anxiety disorders, more or less the amygdala is often going to be overactive as well as the prefrontal cortex would be underactive, okay? So we look and we see that uh, there'll be different uh, neurotransmitters like uh, less serotonin, too much dopamine. In terms of evolutionary theories, we know that anxiety can help us to survive, but problems arise when that anxiety is going to be exaggerated or multiplied, and it's done at the wrong time. Then the thing is, we have what we call the triple vulnerability theory, and this is talking about how anxiety disorder disorders emphasizing interactions between the biopsychosocial model, that being the biological factors as well as looking at uh, psychological factors and then those specific psychological factors being the dog. All right, so there's an app that they have and you might want to get it and you don't have to but 
I'll share it with you anyway. It's called the Mind Shift app, and it lets us see how anxiety uh, can help in in terms of allowing us to do breathing exercises. Um, it starts to challenge your irrational thoughts, as well as give you different um, things you can do to help with the behaviors. Okay, how? what extent the apps can do to replace face-to-face -face help that's a different story from a different book you still want to be able to interact with family or friends if it's really serious you definitely want to be able to get therapists or any other kind of mental health professional involved to help you through but mind shift can at least help those that's demonstrating mild symptoms so now we're going to take a look at depressive and bipolar disorders and as you can see on the slide, we have three well-known people um, who have actually struggled with depressive um, disorders or bipolar disorders. Uh, you have Abraham Lincoln, Kanye West, and Ella DeGeneres. And they've shared their stories, expressing, you know, throughout time. It's been noted as far as in history books and such that uh, Abraham Lincoln was a depressed man. Unfortunately, Kanye demonstrates it continuously that he uh, has bipolar disorder. And then Ellen DeGeneres has shared that she's dealt with uh, depressive symptoms as well. So in this category, this is when we're dealing with extreme moods or emotional states. And the main ones uh, are named as major depressive disorder, Persistent depressive disorder, which was once known as dysthymia, this is when a person has been depressed for over six months. You have the bipolar disorders. And now when I say bipolar disorder, you actually have bipolar one and bipolar two. Uh, and we'll talk about it more. But then you have the cyclothymic disorder, which is where you might have a range of going through a depression, depressed state, and it might happen three, four times within a year, stops, starts, and you get the picture from that. All right, so looking at major depressive disorder and persistent disorder, uh, here with the major depressive disorder, before we would provide a diagnosis of that, a person would have to be uh, presenting with a depressed mood and loss of interest in that, uh, activities like anhedonia. Uh, they might look at act fatigue, lethargic. Here they, um, they would have to have it for at least two weeks before we would consider major depressive disorder. Because a lot of times we all get sad about something. I mean, think about right now, the, the world we're living in today, being um, dealing with uh, COVID-19. It's sad times. So we can imagine people are have struggling and dealing with it and trying to cope with it. But you'll have some people, we've been within this now in a month, a little over a month. And for some individuals, they are feeling just as emotional uh, as day one. That's a person with, if they're exhibiting that same sense of sadness and not uh, working toward coping with the situation is when we would be classifying them with possibly uh, having major depressive disorder. Main system here, symptom here though is that intense sense of sadness. Some things that might happen is your eating habits can change. For some people they'll overeat. They'll try to compensate and make themselves feel better by eat, 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 eating, emotional eating. Then you have some who won't, and because of that, they'll either have weight gain or weight loss. A lot of people that are um, that have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder also experience sleep disturbances. They may not get any sleep, or they may not feel like they want to get out of bed. You ever have those days where you feel so out of it, so sad that I don't even want to get out of bed today. I'm just going to stay here that's what those sleep disturbances would be. Now in terms of the persistent depressive disorder, this is where it's chronic, like I mentioned. 
The symptoms, though, they've changed it. I said six months. It has to be present for at least two years now rather than just two weeks. So you've learned to live with it, basically, but it hasn't gone away. So now we're going to look at bipolar disorder and the cyclothymic disorders, okay? Here, think of it as a, um, poles when we're talking about bipolar disorder. A person that has bipolar disorder, they're going to alternate the poles of mood, that being high um, times of mania and then very low times of depression. People with bipolar disorder find that the manic episodes are extremely disturbing. When we look at it in small doses and during appropriate times, there's going to be intense energy that can be uh, really great. So imagine your reaction when you scratch off or win a lottery ticket, for example. Or you might get that job of your dreams. Or you might even get backstage passes to your favorite concert. You never know. But in terms of mania, that person it can make them feel out of control. That elation goes through the roof. Okay? And it really doesn't have anything identifiable, you know, in terms of reasons for why it's, why they're having that feeling in the first place. And then it stays. And you, you go up in this high and it doesn't come right back down the way, okay, yeah, I, I hit the number. I hit lottery. Okay, I'm normal again. I got happy and I did my dance and now I'm just going to go get my money and keep going. But a person who might be presenting with bipolar disorder, that feeling, they don't know how to get it to come back down when they need it to. So it's during those manic episodes, which it can last for days at a time, and people really can't seem to stop and breathe again. They feel continuously full of energy, like they're bouncing off the walls, literally. Um, and there's very little need. You, you'll see a person who when they're in this manic state, uh, they really don't get any sleep. So, big disturbance there. During this time in that manic phase, they have no inhibitions and they find themselves doing things they really shouldn't be doing in terms of their behaviors that can really have some, uh, it could be a detriment to, to their daily living. So, it's these indiscriminate types of talking that they'll have. They might be spending a lot of money working or they might be become act like sex addicts. Um, and this, if it goes on for too long, you can tell that big problems can arise from that. Okay. With cyclothymic disorder, this is that longer term, but it's a lower intensity of uh, bipolar disorder. These symptoms last um, have to be around for at least two years. And like I said, throughout the year, you see these cycles and they stay, but it keeps on going. And it's, it's like they can almost time when it's going to happen. More professionals can. person with a bipolar disorder, they really, until they recognize that they have it, or the cyclothymic disorder, they really wouldn't see it coming or when it happens. So now, when we're talking more about this, about who gets depressed and who has uh, major depression or the persistent uh, depressive disorders or bipolar disorders, we look at this chart here to kind of help us understand, okay? We look in terms of course, uh, the course of depression and persistent depressive disorder. Uh, here, people with depressive disorders, the course to their employers is kind of similar to workers without depressive disorders. But research has found that U.S. workers with major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder experience more than three times as many hours of lost production. So it does impact. Um, and that even hap that, that either happens because they're absent a lot or even when they're there, they're not doing much. Okay. So <clears throat> of course, this of course employers more than three times as much money 
as it would someone who's not experiencing that. The second most common category for disorders is what these two would be. And among Americans, 20.8% have been diagnosed with a depressive or bipolar disorder sometime in their lives. Here in the U.S., approximately 9.5% of the population has been diagnosed within the past 12 months. There are uh, gender differences that are going to be depending on which disorder. Uh, but depression is generally going to be experienced and defined differently all around the world. So not everybody is going to show the exact same symptoms at the exact same time. All right. So when you hear these commercials for these antidepressant medications, you often hear uh, them speak about how a person is chemically imbalanced. So there is a theory about chemically imbalanced. Uh, it states that the levels of certain brain chemicals, they're basically going awry in people and that these disorders, um, it helps with the pharmaceutical companies, of course. but there need to be more research um, to clarify specific mechanisms in terms of this. Uh, ways that we can work toward protecting ourselves is, from being depressed is trying not to what we call ruminate. Rumination is when you continuously keep going back to something. Like say something happened to you 10 years ago and you keep bringing that right back up to current day. That's what we call rumination. And you wanna to try to avoid doing that. But when something bad happens, thinking about it over and over again, is only going to make you feel worse. So avoid ruminating. But some biological factors that are present is that genetic link for major depression or bipolar disorder. There have been studies dealing with uh, <clears throat> twin studies, y'all know the more if it's a monozygotic that's been being able to show uh, a more of effect compared to dizygotic twins. Uh, we've known and learned that brain abnormalities with the bi depressive and bipolar disorders would be uh, expressed within our limbic system. And then in terms of psychological factors it's those th that irrational thinking that comes up again, those illogical thoughts where a person who's depressed or dealing with um, bipolar disorders, they tend to be more cynic uh, and pessimistic. They definitely see the, half, the glass half empty rather than half full. When we talk about the depressive schema, again, this is that framework that kind of have people seeing everything negatively. You remember when I asked you about do misery do misery love company? Well, individuals who are presenting with major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder, they don't want to see you happy. And so, yeah, misery loves company because they're going to talk down about everything in your conversation because at that point they don't see anything positive. Finally, I'll say again, rumination is when you're thinking about your shortcomings and failures over and over again. Try not to do that. All right, so there's another, you know, going to talk about these different apps that you can try. You don't have to, but I'm going to mention them. And this is the Mood Track Diary, which helps uh, people to be able to kind of jot down information about their mood throughout the day and, and it allows them to count how often these thoughts and feelings occur. Um, it'll give you charts and other ways um, to provide you with feedback on how you can help change these moods. So some questions that might be asked is how could this be helpful for a psychologist that's seeing someone who has a depressive disorder or a bipolar disorder? Well, this type of app is actually what we can call cognitive behavioral therapy in the sense that it helps them to break down the illogical thoughts, they learn and see what's triggering the situation, and then they're doing homework to kind of change the behavior, makes the person more active. A psychologist can kind of implement in therapy 
them utilizing this mood track diary so that they can tell the psychologist when things are happening, how they were happening, and what they were able to do to try to stop the uh, sad feelings. And if it didn't work, this is when a psychologist can come in and say, okay, well, let's try to do these things instead. How does this app affect your appreciation of the difficulty in drawing the line between normality and abnormality? I'll leave that question to you. You might want to try it. All right, so now we're going to move on to eating disorders. And again, this is a category that's involving significant disturbances within behaviors that's related to eating or foods. The most common eating disorders, again, is anorexia nervosa. Here, the individual have such difficulty seeing themselves uh, that they're overweight even when they are within the normal weight range. They tend to over-exercise. They'll minimize eating to almost nothing. Where seeing a spoonful of rice, they'll feel it's too much to eat. Um, they'll use uh, laxatives, all sorts of things, because they have a poor body image of themselves. With bulimia nervosa, their similarities in that they have issues with how they see themselves. They might find themselves um, having difficulty with their body image. But unlike a person who's anorexic, where a person who's severely anorexic, you will tell you can tell because they'd be extremely underweight. A person who has bulimia nervosa, you're really not going to see, you might not see that because they do things a little differently. They still may do over exercise. They'll eat and that eating can include binge eating. They'll try to gobble everything up and then what they do is regurgitate. They're going to throw that all back up. Um, and that's where they, the difference between them and a person who has anorexia. They just won't eat. If they are possible, they try not to eat at all. It's pretty much close to starving themselves. Binge eating disorder, like I said, this is new to the DSM. But these are individuals who, when they eat, they just can't control the amount they're eating. They're taking in like it's no tomorrow. They'll eat because of their emotions. They may eat because of a lot of different factors. But the bottom line is now with the difference here between binge eating and bulimia, they're not trying to throw it up. They just keep eating. Okay. So just as I gave a, this picture in, here on this slide for anorexia nervosa gives you a good indication of what a person sees themselves as, okay? People with anorexia, they, they see this distorted view of their bodies and they're thinking they're fat when they're really often underweight. And as a result, that refusing to eat to try to maintain a healthy body weight is what happens. So some dangerous issues that can happen to this prolonged malnutrition is that they can have an irregular heart rate, chest pains, hypothermia, lose their hair, skin dries out, and it can be fatal. Approximately 5% of the cases that's been uh, reported has resulted in death. Again, in terms of bulimia nervosa, understand that they go through the cyclic of binging and purging, okay? Usually happens at least once a week for a three month period. When they're binging, it's high calorie foods. It's like, I can have anything I want because I'm gonna just let it go, okay? But they do feel ashamed and embarrassed about this whole situation. Like I mentioned, they do look like they have normal weight, but Big problems that they'll have physically would be dental issues. They'll have a chronic sore throat or they can really damage the esophagus, as well as continuously having heartburn. And again, like I said, there's a similarity in terms of uh, bulimia, but there's no purging present. It's where they do this at least once a week for a three month period for us to be able to do a diagnosis. 
they do feel ashamed and guilty about it and although it's something that we recognize for years like i said it's only now that it's uh, being classified as a psychological disorder in the dsm-5 so looking at who might be uh diagnosed with eating disorders this is generally occurring during adolescence and young adulthood the female to male ratio is 10 to 1 and it's actually very rare, pretty rare here in the US, but the rate is less than 2%. And it's due to negativity in Western cultures like the media can be a big reason for it. So when we look and talk about American te television, we know that uh, eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia until then, it was it really was non-existent until they decided they wanted to start putting these really slender uh, women and girls on TV. Soon after that, girls and women, they really started evaluating their bodies and they started looking at it negatively. And then they started, the rise of eating disorders had happened and occurred. So why do we develop? How come how come eating disorders happen? Well, like I told, told you before in twin studies, it's demonstrated that there has been some heritability. There are psychological factors that's been um, in place, particularly those who uh, have been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa tend to be trying to be perfect. Sometimes they have parents that, you know, try to push them into it and they feel that, you know, you can look so much better. Those are also factors and reasons to make them think that they have to be perfect. For bul bulimia nervosa, is pretty much a sense of impulsiveness. And then for another factor, and this is for all of the uh, disorders, it's this all or none thinking. I got to have it or I don't do it at all. Sociological factors would include that ideal thing that we were talking about in terms of media exposure. And then culture, for some, it actually, the culture within, like I've mentioned, some parents and so forth, thin is beautiful, but it depends on the culture. If we look at the African culture, for example, a woman who's slender is considered poor, whereas a woman who is plump, pleasantly plump, is considered to be rich. So it's also cultural uh, factors involved with how people see each other. All right, so let's talk about schizophrenia. This is a psychological disorder that's on a very severe side of the spectrum in terms of psychological disorders. Uh, here, a person um, would be having problems, particularly bizarre disturbances, with their thinking, their perceptions, how they feel, uh, and the different behaviors that they'll present. The term psychosis is considered to be a significant impairment to one's reality. That meaning this is the basic ability to be able to tell the difference between what's the real world and what's within one's imagination. Now, psychosis and schizophrenia doesn't mean uh, multiple personalities. We'll talk about dissociative identity disorder, which is what uh, we now say instead of saying multiple personalities. However, when we talk about schizophrenia, we're looking at three categories in terms of symptoms, that being positive symptoms, negative symptoms, as well as cognitive symptoms. Now, when we talk about the positive symptoms, we're looking at how a person would present with uh, these particular type of symptoms, that being delusional thinking or hallucinations. With delusions, these are truly false uh, beliefs that a person would possess. However, to them, it's extremely real. Um, an example I'll give you is when I worked at Mississippi State Hospital, and during that time, it was weird. They, uh, I had a 
patient who thought I was trying to steal their husband. So that's the delusion. The only way I was able to help the patient cope was I had to go out. I had to buy a wedding uh, ring because at that time I wasn't married. And I had to show them a ring. I cut out pictures from a magazine of a man and I showed him the picture of the man and said, this is my husband. You don't have to worry. I'm not trying to go after your husband. And as long as he was on medication, that worked. Um, needless to say, when he wasn't on uh, medication and he was actively psychotic, yes, he would att attempt to attack me. So another uh, symptom that we look at is hallucinations. And now one of the things I want to say, these are false sensations as well as perceptions. There's three main types, that being auditory, where they're hearing things, and there's visual, where they're seeing things, and then there's tactile, where they're feeling things that's actually not there. Um, the most common type of hallucination, though, are for a person with schizophrenia is generally going to be auditory because they're hearing voices within your head. Now, when we talk about negative symptoms here, we're looking specifically more about how their mood is. Um, here, a person usually with schizophrenia will uh, present with a flat affect. That means emotions are really not being uh, seen at all for this um, person. And then there's the A symptoms. A symptoms are talking about alogia, and this is when there's no speaking with person with schizophrenia won't speak. Abolition is that there's really no initiative or motivation by the person. And then anhedonia is that they, they just can't feel any sense of happiness within them. So here though, when we talk about negative symptoms, these are not going to be as noticeable as would be uh, the positive symptoms, but you have to realize they will be present. Now, sometimes a person with schizophrenia, they're going to have speech or, or writing of someone um, that's going to be jumbled. And it could be a single sentence, um, which we would consider to be like baffling. This phenomenon is what we call word salad. And then there are going to be other times when a person's speech uh, might be sprinkled with uh, neologiums, uh, entirely new words that they create on their own. Um, but that's uh, a lot of the difficulties a person with schizophrenia would have. So there's loose associations or derailment and pretty much in their thinking, when we're talking about loose associations, what they are relating one task to be in, for example, would have nothing to do with that task uh, exactly. Or they'll start on a particular uh, area and then they might, when we say derailment, think of how a train goes off the tracks. They really go way off to the left or right in the conversation in which they might show uh, what we call tangential or circum, uh, circumstantial type of speech. And when we talk about tangential, that means they jump from one topic to the next topic to the next topic, okay? Now, one thing I want you to see in terms of when we're talking about uh, cognitive symptoms in schizophrenia, look at this particular excerpt that we have here. Um, and Look how disjointed and illogical the nature of the thought is, as well as the speech um, that someone with schizophrenia might present with. Okay, I'll read it out loud for you. I am seeking truth and seeing it, which is holy seeing, a sacred pun, meaning I'd been given a nod of approval from the Vatican, the Vatac, the Vat I can. I can see that I am at sea, that I will get C's in all my classes, the gentlewoman's C's for good attendance and sitting for every test, though I am no lady bird Johnson, 
I don't wear white gloves or send invitations for tea. I don't garden or beautify America's highways. But there is the matter of the piano's high C and canned orange juice drink and high C's and seven C's and seize the day and eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow we die and conk. That gives you an example of what we just talked about in terms of loose associations as well as derailment. Uh, it could be pretty frightening for people who are not understanding that this person might be uh, suffering from schizophrenia. A movie that I recommend everybody to watch because it gives a great example of um, what a person uh, dealing with schizophrenia might be contending with is A Beautiful Mind. Uh, here is about John Nash. He was a winning mathematician that was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It demonstrates how he had delusions of paranoia that he felt people were after him. He also had hallucinations. He also, um, and the movie really had a pretty good, accurate description and portrayal of John Nash. So Russell Crowe did a great job with this film um, as the lead actor. So I do recommend if you've never seen this movie, if you do have Netflix, see if it's in Netflix, check out Amazon Prime and see if it might be there. Um, and try to get to watch this movie because it is an excellent rendition um, and it tells you, uh, gives you a pretty good idea about schizophrenia. So who can get schizophrenia anyway? Usually we notice and see that the prevalence is high during later uh, adolescence into early adulthood. Now it's really rare but it occurs within less than 1% of the population. And it kind of holds through di different cultures as well as countries. But one thing I do want to make mention um, when we're speaking about different cultures and countries, here in the uh, Western civilization, the United States, people, once they are diagnosed with schizophrenia, they tend to have it for life. Uh, whereas we found research has demonstrated that there are some um, areas like in Africa uh, in which people who may uh, have um, schizophrenia, they actually go into remission um, and it's not as severe as it will be here. One of the thoughts about that might be is the kind of world we're living in our, our, our country in terms of how industrialized we are, how busy we are, um, how individualized we are. So we have to look at it. but. When we look at the differences between men and women, there really are not uh, any true difference, but women tend to uh, get schizophrenia closer to their 30s than they would to their t uh, adolescence or teens. Men tend to get it between 18 and 25. Females tend to get it around 25, 30. So, uh, in terms of ethnicity, there's been a lot of misdiagnosing when it comes to schizophrenia. Uh, the disparities are just, it's, it's, it can be severe at times. So this figure here is giving you an idea in terms of uh, heritability in genes, shared genes um, in schizophrenia. The odds that a person will develop schizophrenia will increase significantly with the percentage of genes that the person shares with someone. So we've talked about twin studies and that helps us to understand that if um, an identical twin has uh, schizophrenia, what would be the likelihood that the other twin may uh, develop schizophrenia? It's great. It would be 100%, okay? Fraternal twins would be at 50%. Uh, other relatives m would demonstrate 25%. And then cousins or so forth in your family that might have it, then the likelihood would be for it to be 12.5%. But this, this uh, 
graph gives you a good idea in terms of the risk uh, pertaining to family members. Now, with this figure, we're here looking at birthdays of people with schizophrenia. And pretty much the month in which a person is born will influence the risk levels of developing schizophrenia, with spring births actually showing uh, the highest risk, believe it or not. The underlying reason might be that the increased risk of flu uh, is expect in, in expecting mothers during the middle months of pregnancy, it might be happening during this time. That was a study that had been conducted. But when we're talking about the biological factors in schizophrenia, we look at those structural differences that occur within the brain. Um, the main thing you want to know in terms of uh, brain structure and abnormalities for a person who has schizophrenia, they'll present with enlarged ventricles. They're going to have smaller hippocampus, a smaller amygdala, as well as a smaller thalamus. Dopamine is one of those um, trans, uh, neurotransmitters that we uh, have seen uh, impact schizophrenia, where we call it the dopamine hypothesis. And then there'll be uh, risk factors based upon a pregnancy in terms of uh, what month they were born in, as I mentioned, and then how was mom eating? Was the expected mother eating appropriately? Is there any kind of malnourishment? Studies have indicated when malnourishment has been present that it increases the risk of getting schizophrenia. All right, so now we're going to take a look at uh, disorders um, from childhood of childhood. And we're going to look at atten attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as well as the autistic spectrum disorders. So as you can see, if you don't recognize him, actor uh, Channing Tatum, uh, he was diagnosed with ADHD as a child. And pretty much this disorder comes in uh, during childhood and it shows significant problems with one's attention, whether they're impulsive or hyperactive, or they could be presenting both. Um, usually symptoms have to be present before age 12 for us to uh, reach that diagnosis. The symptoms must also have at least uh, be able to be seen in two settings. And I say this, and this is important. For example, I have a niece um, that uh, I had raised as a, uh, for, I was a foster parent from birth to five years old. And then she went back to her mom and mom called me up and said, well, kid's been diagnosed, she's been diagnosed with having ADHD. And I'm like, okay, since when? And she was like, well, they said that she's not paying attention in school, that she's not able to sit still. And the first thing I asked uh, her mother was, well, do she do all these things at home? And she says, no, she follows instructions. She, you know, she does everything she's supposed to do. I don't ever see her running around and acting like she, you know, can't sit still. I said, then that means she doesn't have ADHD. And you tell them that they have to do an appropriate uh, uh, psychological uh, assessment and not just say it because that's what the teachers think. Okay. For a while, we had a big problem uh, in which kids were being labeled with ADHD because they were being kids. Let's remember, kids are rambunctious. Think of the five to eight year olds. They like running around, they like playing, and no, their attention spans are not as large as we would like it to be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have ADHD. So the main thing in, in that, it has to be at least two settings. They have to show that at home as well as at school. Um, there would be uh, issues with um, performance in, um, academically. That's generally common because their attention spans are shortened, um, and as well as the impulsivity, they, they're not able to maintain focus. This can persist in adulthood, and it shows co uh, a lot of individuals with ADHD as adults, we look for anxiety or depression or even substance abuse. But do know that it can be handled and managed if it was caught early and uh, coping strategies were put into place for a person with ADHD. It gets 
think of it this way it's more severe as a child but through proper training and everything as an adult they become it becomes less severe now the autistic spectrum disorders this is one of those really um, controversial areas in terms of the DSM-5 uh, because this is one of those disorders where they had combined several disorders um, like Asperger's disorder, autism, child disintegrative disorder. All of these were combined where they used to be uh, separate disorders uh, in the DSM-4TR. Uh, but now it's, it's under a, a spectrum or a continuum, so to speak, in that we'll look at different levels. So their, their level ranges from one to five, for example. And a person, um, first and foremost, symptoms that they're gonna be demonstrating would be in communication problems with socialization um, issues, uh, repetitive patterns of behavior, um, rigidness uh, as well as um, just having overall issues in those terms. Symptoms generally will appear around two years of age but not necessarily. Uh, those who um, have heard of Asperger's disorder, this is a disorder where the problem is more on the social, um, social interactions uh, having deficits in that area rather than deficits in communications and to the term under the DSM-5 they would be now considered a level one whereas a person who would have been uh, having problems where they're not even able to speak would be considered a level five as far as having autism so there are adults in um, that can live independently I do have a son who um, he's within the autistic spectrum disorder and prior to the DSM-5 he was considered to have Asperger's disorder. He's one of those people that do not like the fact that they made these changes. I'm the other one. But uh, individuals under the spectrum, <clears throat> autism spectrum, they can live uh, quality lives with help um, and assistance and support and proper training. So, now, reason there's a uh, discrepancy between smaller number of kids who will get ADHD diagnosis or and a larger number of kids who might get uh, the diagnosis is really not going to be a clear picture. It's, uh, it's relating, you know, to the fact that you'll have parents, teachers, as well as uh, kids that's going to be familiar with the diagnosis. So when they seek help from a professional, is it ADHD? Well, maybe the question that guides the conversation, which can throw in bias. Also, despite the need for a thorough evaluation, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times pediatricians will automatically give the diagnosis of ADHD after a brief visit that would include just questions from the child's behavior. Like I told you, the same thing held true for the pediatricians like it does the teachers. Um, so, and researchers have been able to see that 5 to 7% of children would actually qualify for uh, ADHD. Yet, the range, like I mentioned, was increased uh, to, from to 11 to 15%. So, we can understand where that discrepancy is coming from now. When we talk about autistic spectrum disorders, here we know that it affects one to two percent of children. Boys are gonna be five times more likely to be diagnosed than girls. The prevalence rates though are consistent across different countries and has increased over time. The autistic spectrum rates are significantly higher now than they were decades ago and there's a finding that may be attributed to a number of different factors. That's including increased awareness about the disorder, as well as changes in the way it's been defined, as well as changes in the way it's being assessed. So we're still not 100% sure why there's been an increase, but these are some possibilities on why it did. Who develops 
childhood uh, psychological disorders. There's no real one single root cause. Some issues though with ADHD, we see that there might be some biological factors that's included in genetics, brain abnormalities, as well as low birth weight babies. Environmental factors would include exposure to those uh, teratogens or toxins. Other environmental factors demonstrates that it can worsen, but it's not going to be the true factor for someone being diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, some causes for autistic spectrum disorder, we've seen that there are biological factors present, that being genetics, uh, issues with prenatal, as well as childbirth complications. But you know you've heard the story where a lot of people are not having their children vaccinated because they're afraid they're going to be autistic. There has been no true proof that vaccine causes autism. Okay, none. Um, this is a notion that parents get because they didn't see the symptoms early enough so they blamed it on the only likely cause that they can think of. They don't want to feel that they might have a genetic predisposition so they use the, uh, they'll rationalize that it is because of vaccines. But it hasn't been proven. All right, so now earlier we were talking, I, I talked in the lecture and I told you that we were going to talk about dissociative disorders. A lot of people know dissociative disorders in terms of multiple personalities. That falls under the category of dissociative identity disorder. But there's two others that we will talk about as well, which is dissociative amnesia as well as dissociative feud. Now in this particular disorders, here, this is when a person is losing awareness and becomes kind of disconnected from themselves, uh, like their memories, they, you know, and it's usually due to a traumatic event. Um, so they might not be able to recall their memories, which is the amnesia, or their emotions get too, uh, get too intense for them. Um, and that's where that fugue, they just seem like they go, they become a void as well as the identity and that's when those multiple personalities that you've heard of comes about. So this person here, this is Shirley Mason and she's, she is who Sybil is and you hear it on the TV shows, uh, the movies about Sybil. In the early 70s, Sybil experienced dissociative identities disorder in which she had 16 different personalities. And again, like I said, this was a main focus of a, a best-selling book as well as a TV movie. The fame of Sybil's case had helped in the sense that it allowed people to become more aware about the disorder. But since that time, dissociative identity disorder has also has been so rare that we, we wonder whether or not it really exists anymore. Um, and right now the movie is slipping my mind, uh, Split. That's the most recent movie, which I wasn't really thrilled. I haven't watched the movie because I felt it gave negative connotations in terms of dissociative identity disorder, making people believe that people, um, that there's violence attached to this particular disorder. You have to be careful of what you see. Always question. Uh, not everybody is going to have a murderous streak or be a, a serial killer in, within one of their personalities, okay? But um, continuing on, the fact that there are some therapists, including the one who uh, treated Sybil, they'll encourage their clients to try to experience the dissociative identity disorder, um, but it casts doubts on whether there's a validity of the disorder in itself. Now, like I mentioned, there's those two others. When we look at dissociative amnesia, the main thing you're gonna know about it is that a person do uh, have difficulties being able to recall important information about their past. These memory gaps, they're generally gonna be associating with a traumatic event, event that occurred. Um, so that that's why they kind of, it just, it, it tears them from themselves 
where they're not able to remember. Dissociative few, the main thing again is where they're just wanting to jet. They're, they're wanting to disconnect from their reality. Therefore, they may just disappear um, and they'll travel somewhere or relocate to a new uh, town, new state and can't really tell you why they're doing it. But again, it's been uh, seen to be attributed to traumatic events. There was a movie, and I wish I could remember the movie, in which the young lady played a, uh, she played a waitress, and she witnessed a crime, and she then had, it appeared to be dissociative amnesia, but actually it was dissociative few, because she went on and just traveled and travel and, and started living life as a different person um, and if I come up with the name I will share it but right now it's it's invading me all right so who gets dissociative disorders and why do they develop again this is one of those extreme uh, disorders uh, extremely rare, rare disorders only approximately 1% of the population has been diagnosed with this disorder Again, like I mentioned, there is, um, because it's so rare, the controversy, um, particularly with dissociative identity disorder, is does it really even exist anymore? Um, and there was a surge of diagnosis back in the 70s and 80s, but I think this surge came from the fact that people started learning more about it. So just like with ADHD, we start seeing an increase because one finally just discovered it. So a lot of people said, okay, this must be what they have, what they have or possess. Know though that with dissociative um, disorders, it again, it, the trauma is the main risk factor, okay? It often occurs in childhood. And usually with the uh, dissociative amnesia, it's usually a more recent type of tra trauma that would trigger that type of disorder to occur. So now let's talk about personality disorders. First and foremost, this is a this particular disorder is based on an enduring pattern of where we say inflexible, uh, inflexible and maladaptive behaviors, and it's going to show itself across a lot of different situations. Um, and it often has a person with uh, personality disorders. This is a lifelong event for them. Um, and it will have, they'll have problems with their relationships, they have problems just dealing with people in itself, those interpersonal interactions. Generally speaking, though, we wouldn't tell, say that a, a child um, that's five years old has a personality disorder, um, but we would start seeing symptoms in late childhood as well as in early adulthood. There are 10 different personality uh, disorders that's been identified uh, in the DSM-5. Uh, two main ones, though, would be borderline personality disorder as well as antisocial, uh, antisocial personality disorder. Now, this slide here gives you a list, and you'll see that because I do have the chapter for you inside of Canvas for you to review and read with. But this gives you some of the different personality disorders that's present. Those who uh, di are diagnosed with antisocial persona personality disorder, these people, they have no qualms or cares in the world about you. They only care, worry about themselves. They'll exploit you. Um, things that they do is self-serving. If they see a diamond ring, just for an example, a uh, diamond ring in the jewelry store, they have no problem stealing it. And they have no remorse about what they do because it's about them. And they see, well, why should I have to want? Why can't I get type of attitude? People that's been diagnosed with avoiding personality disorder, here they're afraid to be, they're socially afraid. Um, they're really self-conscious. They're easily embarrassed. 
they're going to they feel you know inferior toward others so and they're thinking that they might be rejected so they try to avoid people at all possible but not that they want to avoid people they would love to connect to people they just don't believe they can borderline personality disorder is one of those dis, um, personality disorders that's the kind of turbulent and unstable in that a person with this disorder tends to change their view of self it's, it's they have an all or none type of attitude in sense of they'll love you one minute but if you do step on their toe they're gonna hate you it's a love-hate relationship that flips instantly um, so they have difficulties maintaining uh, good relationships they're often impulsive have a lot of risk-taking behaviors uh, promiscuity can be one of those uh, and so forth dependent personality disorder here this person is extremely submissive uh, they constantly are seeking approval from others they need to uh, they don't feel that they can do anything on their own or by themselves so they'll always count on somebody to take care of them histrionic personality now these are we call the um, those who love drama if you think of it in that nature because everything has to be the theatrical if they're upset you, you see them just they're going to the extremes of showing their emotions so it's that excessive and dramatic display of emotions that they're going to demonstrate they have to be the center of attention um and generally speaking they are shallow narcissistic personality disorder I am not saying names, but we've seen some people demonstrate narcissism in the sense that they're egotistical, feel that they're entitled, they think that they are self-important above anyone else, um, they're superior to everyone else, and they have to have everybody admire them though. Okay, you can think of anybody, that, that'll give you a clear picture. I won't say names. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Now, there is a difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Here, this is one of those uh, personality disorders where it's where they have to be orderly, perfectionistic, they're micromanagers, over controllers extremely detail oriented very stubborn and rigid um it's the perfection component that's compelling them okay paranoid personality disorder is looking at people these individuals look at everybody as after them they feel like um they can't never let their guards down they gotta always check behind their back and they see everyone else as dangerous or trying to lie to them schizoid personality disorder now we talked about avoidant where people avoid but they really would like to have been around people with schizoid personality disorder they don't have a problem being away from people they don't want to be around people they like being a loner and they have no desires to connect with anyone schizotypical personality disorder now these individuals tend to get um misdiagnosed in terms of people think about schizophrenia but the thing is although they're eccentric they're, they show peculiarities um, and they do at times kind of flutter in between the fantasies and reality they're not going to show uh, the same level of positive symptoms in the sense of um, schizophrenia schizotypical uh, personality disorder these people actually learn to cope with what's going on uh, although we might find them to be odd or eccentric they actually demonstrate functioning daily life functioning better than a uh, person with schizophrenia would all right so what I'm gonna allow you to do is take a look because I kind of explained all of the different uh, disorders already so I will be leaving these on, but going through them, um, just passing through.
All right, I'm going to stop and start talking again here. Why do uh, people develop personality disorders in the first place? At least 10%, approximately 10% of the population can be diagnosed with personality disorder. There are differences, particularly uh, with borderline personality disorder. We find that more females have been diagnosed with disorder. But don't think men can't be diagnosed because I did have a patient that have borderline personality disorder. So it can be both, but the prevalence is more for females than it is males. But on the flip side of that, antisocial personality disorder has been found more prevalent in males. But again, like I said, females can be diagnosed with uh, antisocial personalities as well. Some of the biological factors that we see is, is that there's genetic predispositions as well as sensitivity toward reward and punishment with both of these disorders. Um, and then there's also environmental factors that we have to look at in terms of parent-child relationships. Was there any traumas present? Uh, when we talk about attachment, um, was there a secure attachment, negligence, and things like that? We also have to look at in terms of cognitive structuring, modeling, um, are we looking at operational, the reinforcements uh, in terms of modeling, was there appropriate uh, modeling occurring? Okay, so this ends the chapter on psychological disorders. Again, um, because I am using a different textbook, I do have available to you the chapter uh, in Canvas so that you are able to read it. Um, I'm in the midst of setting up a uh, assignment in Launchpad so that you're able to practice uh, with their questions um, so that during the exam you'll be fully aware because you will receive questions um, on the test for this chapter. So on that note, we are done um, in terms of the semester. Next week will be review time in which you'll be allowed to do practice examinations as well as I'll be giving you different lists of things for you to review for the chapters that has been covered uh, the second half of the semester. Again, I do hope that y'all are all being safe uh, and that if you have any questions or concerns, by all means, please, uh, Please take time to send me a, a message in the inbox here on Canvas. Uh, if you'd like to set up a conference, I'll be happy to do so so that we can chat and talk one on one. Um, but do take care of yourselves. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, I hate that we haven't been able to see each other this second half of the semester uh, in normal ways, but we've gotten through the semester regardless. If you haven't done all your assignments, please get all those assignments done because um, after, I believe, grades go in on May 7th and I want to make sure that y'all all have give yourselves the opportunity to pass the course. So if you've missed any of the assignments, please do get them in. Uh, all assignments are open. Yes, there will be late submission deductions um, as well as attendance uh, policies are still in effect. Okay, but on that note, you take care of yourselves and thank you for listening.